Welcome everybody to the weekly COVID-19 and corruption event put on by the Center for International Private Enterprise. As a reminder, this session, 90 minute session is being recorded. If you have comments that you'd like to make or questions you would like to pose over the course of the presentation to the presenters, please use the chat function and we'll read from it. With that, I'd like to introduce Andrew Wilson. Thank you, Frank. Uh, my name is Andrew Wilson, and I'm the executive director of the Center for International Private Enterprise, or SIPE. And on behalf of SIPE, I'd like to welcome you to What Cheap Oil Means for Corruption and Governance, a virtual event featuring speakers from the state of Maine and here in Washington, D.C. This conference is the eighth in a series of public events on COVID-19 and corruption, which is being organized by our Anti-Corruption and Governance Center, headed up by Frank Brown. Today's event is rather nuanced, and what, what do I mean by that? When you think of the COVID-19 crisis, your mind probably doesn't immediately go to the subject of oil. But at the same time, one clear outcome of the global economic shutdown accompanying the pandemic is a drop in demand for oil and a tumbling of prices. This has clear and immediate implications for the world's top oil producers, which also happen to be some of the world's most corrupt regimes. In development circles, we often talk about the paradox of plenty. That means that countries rich with natural resources tend to suffer certain economic and political disadvantages. Those disadvantages include corruption and poor governance. Corrupt and poorly governed countries tend to be fragile during global economic crises. For one, they can't, stand, they can't easily turn to the global fi financial markets for help. It is safe to say that the world's kleptocrats who depend on oil are feeling squeezed right now. They're looking for new sources of revenue and to change the corrupt governance structures that have kept them in power. It is a volatile, chaotic time. Today, we'll hear from three experts who will help us understand what's going on and perhaps what to expect in the months and years to come. Our first speaker is Alexander Gillies, the author of Crude Intentions, how Oil Corruption Contaminates the World, recently published by Oxford University Press. Alexandra is an advisor with the Natural Resource Governance Institute, and she holds a PhD from the University of Cambridge, where she researched the political economy of the Nigerian oil sector. With that, I'll turn the microphone over to Alexandra. Alexandra, to you. Great, Andrew, thank you. Um, and thanks to Sype for pulling together this very topical event. Um, as you mentioned, oil companies and oil dependent governments are facing particularly difficult times. Along with the pandemic and the global recession, their main source of revenue has dried up. Um, as of today, oil prices have bounced back a bit from where they were in late April when they, some of them literally uh, dipped below zero. Um, they're now in the high 30s. Um, but that's still very low, um, and their future will depend on the pace of the economic recovery, um, which will likely take some time. In this context, a number of oil companies have filed for bankruptcy. Um, others have announced layoffs, plans to delay or walk away from certain projects, and other measures to deal with the crisis. Many oil-dependent governments were already struggling economically, following the drop in oil prices in 2014. Now they're seeing their oil revenues drop further, sometimes to nearly zero in some cases, and they're watching companies abandon future projects on which they would pinned very high expectations. So uh, to kick off the discussion today, I wanna talk um, about two things. One is how the downturn in prices might impact oil industry corruption trends, and the second is some of the kind of political and economic challenges facing oil dependent regimes. So on the first, um, Andrew, as you noted, I just put out a book on oil corruption and it, cases that it describes mostly occurred during the recent oil boom when prices were very high and the industry was just absolutely awash with money. Um, I'm sure you've all heard of the car wash scandal where Brazil's national oil company awarded contracts that were inflated by billions of dollars. And that money was then shared among various insiders and political elites. Um, I've done a lot of work in Nigeria and during the same time there, 
um, the government was awarding really lopsided contracts to well-connected local companies that help them profit um, in ways that, that they shouldn't have. This kind of corruption just can't really fly anymore. There's, there's, there's just not enough money. Um, corruption is expensive. So during a time of low prices, we can expect that its scale will decline. But there are at least three types of corruption that could worsen, and I want to mention them each um, quickly. One is that companies in the oil industry are, you know, on, have fallen on tough times, and so they will face pressure to cost, cut costs, and that could lead to cutting corners. Um, many companies will try to reduce the budgets of non-revenue generating divisions, which would include their compliance departments. And so some of those um, preventative functions may become weaker. They'll also be tempted to cut corners, um, complying with health, safety, environmental regulations can be quite costly. Paying taxes is costly. And so there will be temptation for companies to sidestep these obligations, to dissuade regulators from doing their jobs or exploit weaknesses in the regulatory system. And it's worth noting that those regulators are struggling to do their job and they will until the pandemic is behind us. Um, oversight actors of various kinds are also stuck at home and less able to police the industry um, in the ways that they should. A second area of risk um, can be thought of as kind of a race to the bottom or the risk of a race to the bottom. Um, as I mentioned, a lot of oil companies are looking to downsize their portfolios. They're putting some projects on ice in case they can come back to them when prices go up. And in other, price, other projects, they're really just walking away from altogether. And a lot of companies are trying to sell assets and exit certain countries. Governments of those countries want them to stay. And so there's a risk that governments will grant companies inappropriate forms of relief from their tax, environmental, labor, or other obligations in order to convince them to stay. And we're seeing you know, early signs of this. It's interesting, in, in Colombia, a group of business leaders came together and asked the government um, if they could uh, no longer have to consult with indigenous groups in the way that they had or other forms of tax relief and regulatory relief. If those kinds of relief are offered, those deals may be very difficult to monitor. They could happen behind closed doors. They could happen through kind of discretionary ad hoc processes, which are then inherently susceptible to corruption. And if those kinds of concessions prioritize short-term or private interests over long-term public ones, then you know that would constitute corruption. Um, and there's also a risk that temporary relief becomes permanent if the vested interests um, find that to be favorable. A third form of risk has to do with undue corporate influence over bailouts and other forms of, of relief from this economic crisis. Um, and we're seeing you know, ample signs of this here in the US. Um, the US oil industry enjoys very cozy relations with top policymakers, thanks in part to decades of very large campaign donations, um, extensive lobbying, the revolving door that exists between the industry and key government functions, and close personal networks. This allows the industry to have outsized influence in Washington, including over bailout policies. And any funds that support the oil industry will come at the expense of the communities bearing the brunt of the coronavirus pandemic and the more than 40 million Americans who are out of a job. So thanks to these intimate ties, industry leaders have enjoyed direct access to the president and other top officials. Um, and the administration has adjusted some of the early business relief programs to make sure oil companies are um, accommodated and able to, to access them. Um, the Environmental Protection Agency has also cited the pandemic as justification for 
stopping enforcing a number of very important environmental protections. So that kind of, you know, some people talk about this as state capture or undue influence that private sector actors can have over public policy. In other countries, it may not be private companies, it may be the national oil company um, that's shaping the, the emergency response and the bailout programs. Um, when oil prices dropped in 2014, uh, the national oil company in Russia, one of them called Rosneft, um, received a $15 billion bailout in part because that company is essential to how the Russian regime um, functions. Um, and there's also a risk that national oil companies will just hold on to more money than they should. Um, the Natural Resource Governance Institute has done a lot of, um, has a, a project that's pulled together data from national oil companies from 70 different countries. And what it shows is that when prices go down, the national oil company really passes on that uh, decline to the government. So for an example, just to give an example, when prices went down um, at the end of the most recent oil boom, they dropped by about a half from like around $100 a barrel to around $50 a barrel. The National Oil Company in Angola, the amount that it handed over to the government went down by four times. So a gr much greater magnitude um, and so what we see in a number of countries is national oil companies coming up with tactics to justify holding on to more money than they should, as opposed to passing it over to the public treasury. So that provides a good segue to kind of the second topic, which I'll mention very briefly, which is the predicament facing oil dependent kleptocracies in particular. Um, in Eurasia, in the Middle East, in Africa, and beyond, a number of authoritarian regimes use the oil industry and the revenues it produces to strengthen their hold on power. This takes different forms. Um, in the Gulf, Persian Gulf in particular, we see governments using oil revenues to fund public sector employment, um, to fund cash transfers and other um, welfare mechanisms so as to keep citizens on board. Um, oil revenues are also essential to the elite bargains um, that keep prospective political rivals at bay. Other dictators use oil money to control the economy, and so they can make sure that whoever's getting rich um, are, is loyal and are allies uh, to them. Um, oil money also attracts foreign business partners, and these foreign business partners help legitimize um, the regime. Oil industries boost the geopolitical importance of many kleptocracies. Uh, and it helps them to remain independent from the IMF and other international financial institutions and the kind of scrutiny that those institutions um, can bring. And finally, oil money helps dictators enjoy uh, luxury lifestyles and establish safe landing spots abroad that they could retreat to if they needed. All of that money is drying up right now. And it's very unclear what's going to happen next. And I definitely don't pretend to have any kind of a crystal ball. It's going to vary, obviously, a lot from country to country. And I, I did want to mention a few of the important attributes that differentiate some of these oil-dependent regimes, because I think they will impact how this all plays out. One is that it really matters how dependent you are on oil. Um, some regimes, like the one in Equatorial Guinea, for example, are massively dependent on oil, where others elsewhere are they have a more diversified economic base. Another key variable is the cost of production. When oil can be produced cheaply, its future is more secure. This is true in the Persian Gulf, where um, oil can be produced for, for very low amounts um, per barrel. Um, this means that the industry can remain viable during low price periods, and it also means that the longer term 
outlook for the industry as you know climate change responses ramp up and energy transitions start to occur is also a bit safer than other places such as Algeria, Kazakhstan, Venezuela, most of the Gulf of Guinea area of, of, of Africa where production costs are higher. Those are the projects that are more likely to get cut first as companies start to scale back their operations. Countries also vary a lot in terms of their fiscal position. Um, some oil rich countries have quite a bit of savings or they have the fiscal space to borrow relatively easily. Um, some of these countries that are a bit better off include Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Azerbaijan, Russia, whereas others were facing really urgent debt crises before the coronavirus pandemic arrived, such as Venezuela, Congo, Brazzaville, and Chad. So they're ob that's a, obviously an important um, distinction. And then the final point I'll mention is, is political dynamics, of course, uh, make a big difference as well. And this is where things really can, can diverge. Um, economic hardship of the kind we're seeing now could prompt citizen protests and other forms of unrest. Um, and these could trigger repression or political change and opening up or both. Um, or perhaps the downturn in the oil industry could lead the regime to adopt reforms, such as new commitments to economic diversification, and those could bring new voices to the table and perhaps soften aspects um, uh, of the kleptocracy and how it had run previously. Uh, and there are many other possible outcomes. And I hope, you know, as the discussion continues, um, we can get into some of the specifics of what it might look like in, in particular countries um, or regions. So let me stop there, but I look forward to responding to, to the various questions that people have. Thank you. Alexander, thank you very much. Um, that was a wonderful way to set up this, uh, this session. And I wanted to urge folks, if you have questions specifically um, about uh, oil in Africa, Nigeria, Angola, Alexander is an expert on those two countries. So I think when the discussion breaks down along regional lines, um, keep that in mind. Again, if you have questions, please put them in the chat function of the Ring Central interface, the, the program you're using to connect here, and we'll read them out during the Q&A. Um, as a reminder, this is being recorded, and the name of this session is COVID-19 and Corruption. This week, we're focusing on oil and corruption with three experts. Our next speaker is Ariel Cohen. He's somebody who, for those of us at SIPES, uh, Eurasia section have been working with for years. He's an expert on Russia, um, himself born in Yalta in Crimea, formerly of Ukraine, not of Russia. And no, 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 no. Occupied. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for the correct scenario. Um, so I won't read all his titles because we would eat up much of our presentation time, but currently he's a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council. He's the program director of the International Tax and Investment Center. Prior to that, he was with the Heritage Foundation. He's given numerous uh, interviews to top line media outlets. He's testified on the Hill repeatedly, and he's a go-to person when it comes to not just energy issues in the former Soviet Union, but around the world. So with that, I'll, I'll hand it off to Ariel Cohen. Thanks, Ariel. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, to uh, Mr. Brown and to Site for inviting me. It's a pleasure. Uh, these are trying times, as Alexandra so brilliantly pointed out, for oil and gas industry and for um, uh, the economy in general. Uh, I just got a blank picture. Do you guys have me um, as uh, a video and audio? Yes? We have the audio, yes. Uh, what about video? Um, I see the video. Okay. Very good. So um, I would like to start with Russia because while we are dealing with our severe problems uh, here in terms of the demonstrations, violence, COVID, etc., Russia was also hit with COVID very seriously. Uh, for a while, it was a number two. Uh, country in the world in terms of infection growth. Now it's overtaken by Brazil. Uh, but in the meantime, 
what happened was is that President Putin uh, decided um, to extend uh, his uh, contract, uh, contract with Russia, uh, meaning he decided to uh, zero out uh, the previous presidential terms and uh, to adopt uh, amendments in the Constitution um, that will allow him to stay in power till uh, 2036, when Mr. Putin, if he survives that long, is going to be 84. So while his initial expectations in January did not take into account the impact of COVID and the uh, repercussions of the drop in oil prices, uh, we are uh, now uh, in Russia dealing with a situation where a lot of money, a lot of goodies that were the currency, um, not just uh, of the state budget and the oil and gas revenue, the hydrocarbon revenue in Russia is about 40 to 50 percent, depending on a year and prices, 40 to 50 percent of the budgetary revenue and only 25 to 30 percent of the GDP, maybe less actually. But now, as Alexander pointed out, that source of revenue, current revenue, dried out. Russia still has a very impressive um, kitty, uh, two funds, um, the National Wealth Fund, uh, and I think the other one is called the Oil Growth Fund, whatever. The two national funds that, depend, depending on who you're listening to, uh, are enough to keep Russia afloat with very low oil prices. By very low, I mean in the 20s. Uh, for two and a half to five years. Again, as the prices climb up, the life uh, line, the, the, the duration of the uh, fund increases if the prices go down, the um, timeline shrinks. So uh, this is, uh, to paraphrase uh, Louis XIV, l'état c'est moi, the state is me, the oil and gas in Russia is Mr. Putin. He appointed Igor Ivanovich Sechin, one of his closest confidants, um, to run Rosneft, the oil behemoth, the state-controlled, uh, not state-owned, state-controlled uh, champion. And um, Alexei Miller is running Gazprom. I would say both gentlemen have very mixed uh, performance, but personal loyalty is paramount. Uh, and uh, you'll see in a minute how that translates. So, for example, other Putin cronies, other friends, the Rotenberg brothers, um, the Timchenkos, uh, and others get pretty much uncontested contracts um, uh, to, um, uh, to uh, benefit themselves. And there are many allegations in the media um, that they benefit um, Mr. Putin directly or indirectly himself. Um, we saw with Rasnift um, that, for example, when uh, the going got uh, too tight with Venezuela, Rosneft owned assets um, worth billions of dollars in Venezuela. These are distressed assets. Uh, they're worth probably 10 to 20 cents on a dollar. Uh, and he just Session just unloaded uh, these assets to a state-controlled company to keep the um, um, to keep the uh, Rosneft um, books and uh, functioning and avoiding um, and avoiding uh, the sanctions that Venezuela is subject to by the United States. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, you also saw Mr. Sechin um, using Rosneft funds to force uh, a company, a private company named Bashneft, uh, Bashkortostan, 
oil. Uh, to uh, acquire it, uh, to force the owner to sell uh, way under the price. And that, of course, uh, reminds us of the takeover of UCOS in the early 2000s, the company that was owned and built by Mikhail Khodorkovsky, who is currently in London, Putin's opponent. Uh, Sechin also used the state power to acquire those assets. Um, next slide. A lot of other things not directly connected to oil, eh, yes and no. Uh, let's start with Syria. Uh, in Syria, uh, you saw a push to seize um, oil fields uh, that were at the time controlled by the Americans, uh, a Putin, crony, and oligarch uh, named Yevgeny Prigozhin, uh, the owner of the troll farm in St. Petersburg, sent a private security company named Wagner in Russia, Wagner, like the composer, um, sent these soldiers to seize, yes? What's that? Okay. Um, so you saw in Syria, Russia is playing for oil and using state power to seize oil assets. It is increasing, um, it is increasing uh, the control of the military bases, expanding the bases. The other interesting um, event is inserting Russian air power in Libya. And of course, Libya is 100% oil and gas play. So General Haftar, that the Russians are uh, controlling um, or supporting, uh, General Haftar benefits not just from Russian air power, but Russia is also printing money. So the current scandal is that the government of Malta seized $1.1 billion of uh, Libyan counterfeit currency printed in Moscow. Uh, and of course, Russia is playing a long game in Libya, in Syria, becoming a major actor in the Middle East. Uh, and that has implications, of course, not just for oil and gas currently, but in the long term, uh, as a player, it, Russia thinks it will control the security environment and therefore control the prices. Next slide. Ah, okay, uh, so that's the extent of my slides, apparently. Uh, I would now like to talk about what will happen if the oil uh, and gas um, market slows down. Um, if the oil and, mar oil and gas market, as we saw in May, catastrophically or later on, less catastrophically slows down and is in the 30s and the 40s, as the futures, when you look at um, the future, as you see, uh, oil goes up to the upper 30s, 40s. Uh, that is still not very good for Russia. Russia balances its budget at 55. So it needs to reach out into its reserves for now. Once um, the prices reach 50s and 60s, uh, financially, Moscow will be better off. But for now, uh, the ruling oligarchy uh, will do the following. Uh, they will benefit from government procurement contracts. We saw contracts for pipe, uh, for railroads, for the bridge to the Crimea, uh, major multi-billion dollar contracts uh, inflated times two, times three, times four. Um, we saw some of the pipe for uh, Nord Stream 2 uh, that was laid on the Russian side. The prices were inflated. Um, we see now Rosneft financing the Russian Genetics Studies Institute for the tune of $1 billion. And who is going to head um, the Genetic Studies Institute? Allegedly, the woman who is Putin's daughter. 
a relatively young person. Uh, yes, she is a pediatric endocrinologist. No, she's not a world-renowned geneticist. Um, what else? COVID itself is an opportunity not to be given up. Uh, I looked at some contract prices for PPE, inflated. Um, we're looking at um, um, recent uh, scandals that involve the foreign ministry uh, importing cocaine from Latin America, the foreign ministry with diplomatic pouch or uh, the aircraft. And this is nothing new. I was tracking uh, Russian military using their transport aircraft. Russia has probably the first or the second largest fleet of military transport around the world for 25, 30 years. They're flying heroin from Afghanistan, cocaine from Latin America. That will continue and possibly increase. Um, and um, the drug uh, control uh, agency is called the Agency for Control of the Circulation of the Drugs. And according to many, many reports, these are um, uh, people who not just crack down on the drug trade, but sometimes, unfortunately, partnering in the drug trade. And also the law enforcement controls um, gambling, controls uh, uh, prostitution and things like that, possibly some amount um, of people uh, trafficking, uh, human trafficking. Uh, so I am not worried that the corrupt elites in Russia will go hungry. I'm more worried about the people. So far, we have some data to suggest that Putin's popularity is declining. We will see how they manage the constitutional uh, referendum on the 1st of July, a real test. They are, by the way, proposing that people will vote by mail. Uh, and um, if uh, things go bad, as we learned from Russian history, the revolutions of 1904, uh, 05, revolution of 1917, the components for deep unrest in Russia and also the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, the components are always interruption of supply of food or food affordability. This did not happen yet. And the other situation which Putin most probably will try to avoid is some kind of military engagement that goes bad, a military defeat. I do not see anything uh, on the horizon. Uh, the involvement in a Libya or a Syria is very limited. What's that? Uh, the involvement in Libya and Syria very limited. And the only other place where Russia may interfere is Belarus, and Belarus is not likely to be a battlefield of defeat for Mr. Putin. I'm going to stop here, um, and of course, I'll be happy to answer questions. I think this is a very productive and interesting discussion. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you, Ariel. Uh, that was a wonderful presentation. It sets up lots of questions which we're already getting in the chat function. As a reminder, you're tuned in to the weekly COVID-19 and corruption event presented by the Center for International Private Enterprise. My name is Frank Brown and I head up the Anti-Corruption and Governance Center at SIPE. Our next presenter is Mohammed Al Saidi. He's the program officer at SIPE for the Iraq, Yemen, and Bahrain portfolio. And he's been working in the field of economic reform and capacity building for business and CSOs since about 2004. He was SIPE's country director for the Iraq office until 2014. And since 2015, he has worked in SIPE's main office in Washington, DC. With that, I'll turn the mic over to Mohammed. Thank you so much, Frank, and thanks everybody for joining us today. Uh, actually, I will, uh, I'll be fo focusing on uh, three uh, areas. Uh, the first one is uh, like uh, site activities in general in Iraq and the main, uh, the main impacts uh, or like some of the main impacts. Secondly, what that means for uh, uh, COVID-19 and the fall, uh, the fall of the oil prices uh, for Iraq. And the, uh, the third area would be like what to expect for the uh, uh, for the future and what's what are the best uh, 
a ways to go. Uh, so first of all, uh, as you may know, SIP is uh, an affiliate of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, and it is one of the core institutes of NAD, the National Endowment for uh, Democracy, SIP. Uh, strengthens uh, democracy around the globe through the uh, private enterprise and uh, market-oriented reform. Uh, in Iraq, SIP started since 2003. And just like a brief about Iraq, you know uh, uh, Iraq is one of the major uh, oil-producing countries in, uh, in the world. Uh, it, uh, its rank is fourth in terms of uh, production and in terms of uh, reserves, it, it ranks five. Uh, since 2003, we had uh, a political process, uh, a democracy process. Uh, in Iraq, we had, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, several uh, elections, several rounds of elections, and also we uh, had the pluralism in, uh, in political parties after it was, uh, it was, uh, prohibited. Uh, uh, we had also a constitution. Uh, but unfortunately, due to corruption and mismanagement, uh, uh, around half of the oil revenues since 2003 were uh, dissipated in, uh, uh, in corruption, mismanagement, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, poor governance. The, uh, the estimation of the revenues, it was uh, 850 billion since 2003. And the uh, lost amount is, according to uh, Fairfax Media, is uh, around 500 billion U.S. dollars. Uh, so uh, that's why we, uh, it's not, it's no surprise to see Iraq uh, lagging in terms of the, uh, the Transparency International uh, ratings at the uh, rank of uh, like 168 or uh, 169. Uh, and also we have like high unemployment around 25%. We have uh, poverty rate is also approaching to, uh, uh, to that threshold. Um, all of that uh, had pushed, uh, all of that had pushed uh, several rounds of protests. The most severe one was uh, was recently in uh, in 2019 that resulted in ousting the uh, the government. And uh, you know the new government now is dealing with uh, uh, with the corrupt heritage of its uh, many of its predecessors. Uh, so SIP in, uh, in Iraq since then uh, uh, have been working on several important areas. Uh, uh, SAIP supported the private sector uh, to have a voice in, uh, uh, to have a strong voice in, in policy debate. Uh, and also uh, SAIP uh, uh, supported transparency and supported a market-oriented market uh, market uh, 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 advocacy and, and dialogue. Uh, to name a few of the uh, great programs we had uh, there, so SAIP engaged uh, on several uh, uh, policy fronts uh, on the national, uh, provincial, and also uh, regional. <clears throat> so provincially, sorry, uh, provincially SAIP uh, uh, supported uh, uh, its, its coalition and its partners in, uh, in several uh, provinces in uh, Wasad province, Maysan, uh, Ambar, uh, Diyala, and others. Um, uh, so, uh, working on that area, SIP improved uh, the uh, financial decentralization and also uh, changed the structure of uh, incentives for, uh, uh, for corruption through collective action, uh, where uh, partners from the civil society and, uh, and private sector work together uh, with the local authorities to advocate more transparency in uh, oil and border revenue sharing uh, with the uh, local, uh, with the sorry, with the federal authorities, because you know uh, decentralization, uh, decentralization, uh, centralization is a new to Iraq, and it was uh, on paper. Uh, the local authorities were struggling to get their shares from uh, uh, from the. Uh, 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 from the uh, central government, but they could not. The added value of the civil society and the private sector was key. So they provided the capacity and the know-how on how to advocate, how to use uh, fact sheets, how to use policy papers, uh, uh, how to mobilize their constituencies. And as a result, we had uh, uh, disclosure. Uh, now the federal authorities uh, disclosed how much uh, it owes to uh, 
uh, to the provinces since 2013. Uh, the amounts in uh, oil and gas industry and the amounts also from the, uh, uh, from the border revenues. And also I started paying them. Uh, for example, in, uh, in Wasat, uh, they received uh, uh, like uh, 25 million US dollars and 32 million respectively. Uh, the, uh, and that was through a bank account. So that, that project not only did it uh, enhance uh, uh, disclosure and transparency, but also it provided institutions for sustainability and, and transparency. So that bank account can be monitored and can be tracked regularly. Uh, the, also the civil society and the private sector are working on identifying the priorities for expenditure with local authorities. Uh, and the other, the other uh, interesting area is Kurdistan region. Use, you know, Kurdistan region is uh, so-called semi-autonomous since uh, 1992, uh, and uh, it is still within uh, uh, within Iraq, but uh, uh, it enjoys its uh, uh, its special condition. Uh, so, SIP uh, supported its uh, its partners uh, there in Kurdistan region uh, to enhance the transparency in the. Uh, uh, in the regional budget uh, and provided policy recommendations. Uh, and so when Kurdistan authorities started uh, uh, exporting oil in like uh, uh, late uh, 20, 2010, I think, 20, to 2012, uh, uh, Saipan's partners noticed that uh, 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 the revenues of oil are, are not going uh, on any, any records, are not included in the, uh, in the regional budget. So uh, accordingly, SIP uh, uh, partners uh, started advocating that area and they uh, drafted uh, a law for uh, oil and gas revenues. Uh, so with that law, uh, it, uh, um, it should improve uh, transparency in, in the uh, oil and gas uh, industry. Uh, so SIP supported its partners uh, to advocate uh, the uh, the implementation of that law. So it's unprecedented for a civil society organization to draft a law and then pass it. Now SIP is supporting them to implement that the law. And that law according and uh, as a result of the advocacy, the law is now on the uh, uh, in the priorities of the uh, new regional government in Kurdistan for implementation. <clears throat> the, uh, the other area, uh, briefly, is the national uh, uh, national engagement. Also, SAIF supported uh, its partners in, uh, uh, in Baghdad uh, to focus on uh, areas of priority uh, that are uh, such as combating corruption and transparency, uh, improving uh, 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 bureaucracy, improving uh, the... Uh, uh, the implementation gap and reducing the impl implementation gap uh, and also improving strategic planning and those uh, areas found uh, and those priorities found its way its way to a high ranking uh, a committee in the cabinet uh, during uh, dr abadi's uh, tenure but you know uh, due to uh, political and governmental changes uh, the implementation was uh, was suspended uh, so next, uh, next slide, please. Uh, the, uh, the other area here is the uh, effects of COVID-19 on, uh, uh, on Iraq. Uh, you know, uh, so uh, this government is, uh, is just a new government and is dealing with several challenges in, uh, uh, on the ground, uh, politically and economically and also socially. Uh, the COVID-19, uh, like... Uh, our esteemed colleagues mentioned it. Uh, uh, it led to collapse in the in the oil prices, and that is putting the uh, Iraqi government in uh, in a very serious uh, condition, because uh, the Iraqi uh, Iraqi is a rentier uh, rentier state, and uh, it's uh, heavily dependent on on oil and its uh, uh, expenses. The budget is like more than ninety percent of the budget is uh, is from uh, the revenue of the budget is from oil. Uh, so as a result, the government, with its eight million uh, uh, employees and re uh, and retirees on its payroll, is unable uh, currently to secure the uh, uh, the salaries for uh, for June. Uh, ha hardly it did with uh, with May and April, uh, but for June, it's it's not uh, it's not guaranteed. Uh, 
uh, so uh, that's why it, uh, that leaves the, uh, the government with, uh, with very difficult policy positions or uh, policy choices. Uh, either it cuts the, uh, uh, the salaries, uh, which, puts, in, uh, which uh, puts the government again uh, at odds with the protesters, uh, and that uh, you know uh, might result more uh, in more unrest, uh, or it cracks down on uh, on corruption and uh, uh, and on uh, kleptocrats, uh, tighten the uh, loopholes in the uh, in the budget, tighten uh, the revenue from the uh, uh, from the non non oil sector, such as the border revenues, uh, uh, collection uh, of taxes from the telecommunication uh, companies that are not paying taxes, in addition uh, to other uh, measures, that would also uh, mean means hard politics for the for the government, because the government, the current prime minister, is not enjoying uh, a good political uh, majority or political support. So the kleptocrats and uh, Corrupt political political parties might uh, have a battle with him in the in the parliament, or maybe oust him. Uh, so that's here is a call for the private sector and the civil society is to support the government in making a wise choice in uh, uh, a policy choice in this area. Uh, the other good thing is that the uh, the government is trying to uh, improve its. Uh, regional uh, cooperation and uh, uh, you know maintain strength and relation, relations with uh, with saudi arabia uh, especially and and kuwait especially economic re uh, relations since they are neighboring countries uh, which is uh, a positive uh, uh, sign uh, the effects to the uh, private sector were uh, were serious uh, uh, in iraq and the private sector was not able many many uh, i mean uh, many sectors in, in the private sector many industries were unable to do uh, business uh, such as the construction such as uh, the industry the transportation uh, services uh, they were unable to uh, to work and make money and uh, pay uh, their uh, their employees uh, salaries due to the curfew due to the lockdowns and uh, you know, partial lockdowns. Uh, nowadays, we are having another another full care few in in, uh, in Iraq for for another week, uh, due to the uh, rise in uh, uh, in the infection of uh, of COVID nineteen, which is now uh, the total number of uh, infections seven thousand three hundred eighty seven. Uh, so that uh, means uh, uh, additional challenges to the already weak private sector. Uh, the only industries that are working, uh, you know, the retail, the food, uh, uh, the food industries, uh, telecommunications, and so. Uh, so, uh, how that affects our uh, our transparency programs in uh, in Iraq? Uh, in fact, there is definitely there is an effect on the like physical activities and face to face uh, uh, advocacy, uh, but. Uh, it also provides an opportunity for uh, innovation and uh, and for uh, creativity that we are uh, seeing uh, from our partners. Uh, for example, our partners in Kurdistan are utilizing the social media and the uh, uh, digital sphere uh, and the, I mean sorry the digital arena to uh, to advocate uh, and to increase the uh, the scope of its outreach and. Uh, 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 and mobility uh, on, and mobilization of of the gra grassroots level. Uh, their advocacy is to uh, implement the uh, the oil and gas revenue. Uh, also, our partner in uh, our partners in southern Iraq who are members in the EITI, the Extractive uh, Industry Transparency Initiative, they are also utilizing uh, uh, Zoom to uh, to continue. Uh, their uh, their meetings and to continue them monitoring uh, and oversight on the oil industry. So this is not uh, this is not stopping, uh, and uh, this also, the, you know, with with every challenge there is an opportunity. The opportunity here, the additional opportunity is that it strengthens the uh, the belief and the determination of our partners to continue uh, to continue reforms. Because it's obvious that all of these challenges, uh, this is not the first uh, crisis and it's not the last. Uh, and with all of these uh, crises, uh, had the government uh, uh, implemented policies to diversify the economy and uh, to uh, 
uh, implement reforms, we wouldn't have been in, uh, in this uh, situation now. Uh, the third, uh, apply, uh, this, uh, third slide, please. Uh, we are here talking about like what the expectations in the future for the uh, for corruption and uh, uh, and the oil sector due to COVID nineteen. Um, uh, honestly, I think uh, corruption in in Iraq is is more uh, structural, fundamental, and uh, and institutional. Uh, it's not just transactional that goes up and down with the uh, with the oil, with the oil prices. Definitely, no question. The uh, the high oil prices would uh, give more incentives for. Uh, uh, for corruption, uh, but here with us, it is it is more entrenched. As long as the uh, uh, the root uh, the root causes and the uh, uh, the underlying uh, the underlying uh, 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 the underlying conditions are there, uh, uh, corruption would remain and uh, would continue and would when, when increase. Uh, the root causes here we have is poor rule of law. Uh, poor governance, uh, lack of transparency, lack of uh, accountability, uh, and most importantly, the uh, uh, the rentier nature of the of the Iraqi economy. Uh, so uh, you can see with with this size of corruption in Iraq, we didn't see the big wigs or the uh, big heads of of corruption held accountable. Uh, they travel, they uh, come back, they are acquitted. Uh, so. Uh, accountability is is uh, is very missing here. Uh, so uh, therefore, uh, I mean, the the PT corruption may increase because it means, uh, uh, like, uh, you know, uh, more demand on uh, on uh, on bribes uh, if the uh, prices were cut and uh, sorry if the uh, uh, salaries were cut, and uh, if the uh, uh, can, uh, human can, uh, humanitarian and economic conditions worsen, that may uh, may uh, give more incentives for the PT corruption. The grant corruption, I think, uh, it won't it won't go down. It's uh, you know it's unabated. It is uh, uh, vicious and malicious. Uh, as long as there are the causes, it would uh, remain and continue. Um, how, how that affects democracy in Iraq, definitely it, uh, it, uh, it affects the uh, democracy negatively. Because, uh, you know, according to the, uh, to the IMF, the, uh, 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 the rentier uh, states do not improve uh, politically and it breeds, uh, breeds uh, corruption. Uh, this is obvious because the, uh, the corrupt uh, klep uh, kleptocrats would maintain the status quo and uh, 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 would not uh, uh, practice reforms that are against their uh, vested interests. Uh, so, uh, and uh, at SIPE we have an, uh, an inter uh, interesting term, which is uh, democracy that delivers, uh, which means that democracy would be delivering to, uh, the, to citizens when the government is transparent, uh, competent, uh, accountable, and uh, responsive. And if there are uh, also channels for feedback from from citizens, and all of that is uh, is missing in uh, uh, in Iraq, not only does that uh, gives misconceptions and uh, misinformation about uh, democracy among the like uh, uh, the uh, the simple and uh, uh, you know low education uh, citizens, uh, but it also uh, brings. Uh, uh, nostalgia sentiments of uh, of dictatorship, and we saw that our eyes when talking to uh, to people who are, uh, you know, uh, mistakenly think that democracy is just about chaos, is just about uh, corruption, and they praise dictators in in that regard. Unfortunately, uh, so uh, moving forward, uh, uh, I mean, uh, it's important. Uh, uh, to uh, to do reforms, it's important to give uh, uh, more space for the private sector to have a bigger share in the Iraqi uh, economy. Uh, it is important to uh, give a space and support the uh, civil society and the uh, uh, free media and uh, the private sector organizations uh, to keep their monitoring and keep their uh, uh, advocacy uh, role. 
uh, because they are the vehicles for change, they are the agents for change that the international community should uh, support. Uh, all of the interesting and impressive impact we saw was from the civil society and private sector organizations who are committed to, uh, to reforms. Diversifying the Iraqi economy is a must. Uh, this is not sustainable to be uh, uh, reliant on uh, on oil. It's linked to uh, international uh, competition and prices, international politics. So there must be uh, uh, a functioning private sector in uh, in Iraq. And uh, I'll stop with here. Thank, Thank you. you very, Thank you very much, Mohammed, for a comprehensive look at what SIP is doing in Iraq and uh, your interpretation of the implications of the lower oil prices. I'd like to thank all our presenters, and now we're gonna go into the Q&A section. Caitlin, if you could queue up that slide. Um, before we do, I wanted to remind people that if you'd like to get news about these events, these weekly events every Wednesday, COVID-19 and corruption, just drop us a line on that email address you see there, and uh, we'll put you on our mailing list. The email address is acgc at site.org acgc at site.org and another way to stay informed is through our whatsapp channel um, we're happy to sign you up for that as well there's daily news on COVID-19 and corruption that we push out every morning through the whatsapp channel the final way to stay in touch with us is through twitter um, and you'll see the twitter handle there there we try to tweet out about three tweets a day on corruption issues from all over the world our handle is at site underscore ACGC. That's at site underscore ACGC. And as I understand it, we're about 40 followers away from hitting 4,000 on Twitter. So um, signing up, we'd be grateful for that. So we're going to get into the question and answer section now. If you have questions, please put them in the chat um, function, the chat box there. And I'll be reading them out uh, to the presenters. If it's for a specific person, please indicate that as well. We've got about 90 people on this event, so um, lots of questions coming in. Um, if the presenters could try to answer them fairly quickly, we'll, we'll try to get to all the questions. So the first question is for Dr. Gillis, um, our first presenter. And the question is, the oil market has been hit by demand and supply side shocks due to COVID-19 and Saudi Arabia's March flooding of the market. Does this speed up the future energy transition, especially for higher cost producers like Nigeria? Or are there other lessons we should take away from the current oil market shocks for planning for the long-term energy transition? So that's a question for, for Dr. Gillis, Alex Gillis. Great, thanks a lot, Frank. Um, and that's a really excellent question. Um, you know, I've heard some people describing current events as kind of a dress rehearsal for the energy transition um, for the oil, for oil producing countries. Um, you know, what we need to see if the world is going to address climate change is lowering demand for fossil fuels and how that will play out in the industry, assuming it does happen, um, is that higher cost production and dirtier forms of fossil fuel will likely be um, reduced first. Um, and, and so in some ways, the slowdown um, that it's occurring now due to, to COVID um, is providing kind of a preview of what that might look like. I mean, if you're looking at the, the struggles that U.S. shale companies who, you know, have relatively high production costs were already having. And now, you know, for a number of them, um, this most recent downturn has been the final nail in their coffin. And there's a number of companies um, filing for bankruptcy, et cetera. You also see a number of new producers or aspiring new producer countries, such as those in, in East Africa, you know, having projects that they'd pinned quite a lot of hopes on, uh, really facing much longer delays, and some of them aren't going to happen at all. Um, that this kind of most recent downturn was was um, the final straw for those projects, also. Um, and we see big 
international oil companies like ExxonMobil making announcements about its plan to divest from Nigeria, Equatorial Guinea, other places um, such as that as it kind of consolidates its portfolio. So I do think it, it's a preview of what we will see over the longer term as renewable energies take over a larger share of the market. I, I think the more complicated is the question that you allude to is, is are oil producing countries um, responding to that um, and preparing for that energy transition? Um, some participants in the industry are. I mean, if you look at the behavior of investors who can quite easily shift their money from one industry to another, they are moving away from, from oil in certain ways um, and, and to varying degrees. That's very different than a national oil company or an oil dependent regime that has been in many cases dependent on the industry for decades. And so there's all these ingrained patterns and path dependencies and uh, vested interests that are going to be exceptionally difficult um, to undo. And so I'm not aware of any examples of oil dependent countries, perhaps the exception of, of Norway, that are taking that longer term view and effectively preparing for it now. Um, a lot of national oil companies are saying that they want to be, you know, engines of, of um, renewable energy and help with the kind of greening of, of the, their country's um, energy sector. Um, but there's very little evidence that those institutions have the capacity to do that and their reliance on oil is just so ingrained that it's hard to see see the change. So I guess to summarize, it's it should be seen as a preview of what's to come and it should um, prompt oil producing countries to kind of prepare for that transition so that it doesn't kind of take them by surprise, but there's not a lot of evidence as yet that that's um, happening in any really tangible way. Alex, thank you very much for that concise and uh, very useful answer. We're gonna move on to our next question. Um, this is uh, for Dr. Ariel Cohen, and it comes from Paul Massaro of the US Helsinki, Helsinki Commission. And Paul asks, Dr. Cohen, as US controls more of the market, doesn't that bring in market forces and make corruption harder? Isn't this why Russia and the Saudis flooded the market in the OPEC breakdown. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks to Paul for an excellent question. The Helsinki Commission is doing an outstanding job keeping the focus on um, corruption, uh, suppression of human rights. I was privileged to testify before the commission on the number of occasions. I also testified on the NOPEC, uh, as in no OPEC. Uh, legislation before the Judiciary uh, Committee of the House. And it's interesting that there's a lot of bipartisan support to ban OPEC um, as a, um, a monopolist, as, uh, um, some, as a cartel that violates a number of U.S. laws. I think we should do that. Uh, having said that, uh, de facto, the U.S. became a part of OPEC Plus, of an expanded OPEC with President Trump being drawn into mediation uh, between Saudi Arabia and uh, Russia. Uh, I think the U.S. Uh, demonstrated um, that we are a successful uh, oil and gas producer. Uh, because it's shale and it's more expensive, uh, our prices for uh, profitable production are 30, 35 and higher, uh, $35 a barrel, but yes, our presence uh, in our production uh, creates a glut, uh, drives the prices down, uh, and creates more competition. Uh, more competition will force uh, diversification of petro economies. We saw with uh, Prince Mohammed bin Salman, uh, not my favorite character, not the great Democrat, uh, not a great observer of human rights, but he understands that the oil gig will be up sooner or later for Saudi Arabia, and it needs to diversify. 
Uh, a country like United Arab Emirates understands that, understood that. Dito Qatar. With other countries, it will be much more difficult challenge uh, to diversify their economies. Uh, countries that I study in the former Soviet Union, in Eurasia, Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, Azerbaijan, have a very hard time diversifying their economies. They're trying, they understand that it is not easy. It's not easy at all. What we need to look at, also in the context of a previous question uh, of um, transition to renewables, how expensive that is, where the money is going to come from. Um, I am the first person, the first guy to fully support uh, transition and zero emissions, but I don't hear a discussion of where's the nuclear energy in that. I'm a big proponent of fusion, but fusion is always 10, 15, 20 years away. So how do we come to ample, cheap, available, clean energy is a challenge for this multi-generational shift that we're in the beginning of. I'm sure it will happen. The question is when and how much will it cost? Thank you, Ariel, very much for that. I'm um, going to move on to a question for uh, my colleague, Mohammed, who is a program officer at SITE for uh, Iraq and runs a cutting edge transparency and oil uh, program at SITE. So this question, very simple, is Iraq suffers from multiple problems of mismanagement, corruption, bad governance, protests, and now low, low oil prices. What are some potential balanced remedies for Iraq's chronic problems? So, Mohammed, if you could take a, a whack at that question in three to four minutes, so we can leave up leave time for uh, for the other questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Frank, and uh, thank you so much. This is uh, a really good question. Uh, the thing is that, as you, uh, my friend, mentioned in uh, in the. Uh, in the question, these are uh, uh, chronic, uh, chronic problems. And for chronic problems, it needs radical uh, solutions that uproot the, uh, the main causes. Uh, what we have here in, uh, in Iraq is a political process that has been, uh, and a democracy process that has been hijacked by kleptocrats and uh, corrupt uh, uh, political parties. Uh, those parties, they started the, uh, the political work very modestly and then uh, they uh, showed themselves or uh, called themselves guardians, uh, uh, you know, uh, protectors uh, on behalf of their uh, sects, on behalf of their uh, geographical regions, of their, on behalf of their uh, ethnicities. And as a result, People were supporting them, unfortunately, in, in that role. As a result, they grew very big. Uh, they were not uh, uh, accountable. Uh, they grew very strong. And now, whoever opposes them from their constituencies, from their followers, would be, uh, uh, would be severely uh, treated. Uh, so what we need to, uh, to improve uh, uh, the, the political process is changing changing in the faces and because uh, you know from 2003 until now we have the same faces and they are growing bigger what we need is a change what we need is an electoral law that ensures the bringing in new blood and new politicians young politicians who are really representing their uh, constituencies one of the main one of the main uh, uh, slogans or uh, or calls in the uh, in the protest is that those are not representing us. We did not choose them. Uh, the uh, those corrupt politicians uh, they made the system fit uh, to them. They made uh, they tailored the electoral code so that it ensures their uh, uh, their presence. Uh, they did not uh, 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 enact or uh, or pass. Uh, or I think it was passed, but it's not implemented. Uh, the political parties law, uh, can anyone imagine that uh, a political process and democracy, and uh, it's been for 17 years without a political parties law, 
that uh, organizes and regulates uh, the way they receive funds, the way uh, they receive donations, where are they getting them from, uh, you know, all of those uh, details. Uh, so these two important laws need to be uh, addressed and need to be uh, implemented in a way that uh, ensures reform in the political process. Uh, secondly, it is very important uh, to uh, support the private sector uh, in order to uh, have a bigger role in, uh, in economy and to have another revenue of resource other than oil. Oil should be kept for the future generations. Oil should be put or invested in sovereign funds, uh, just like uh, you know the neighboring countries. Uh, the economic activities should be led by the private sector and the revenue should come from non-oil sources such as taxes, uh, tariffs, any other uh, sources. That way we can have a balance uh, between uh, reforms in the uh, political sphere and uh, in the economic sphere and this way we will be absorbing the anger of, of the protesters who are unemployed. We won't be able to uh, provide employment through the public sector anymore. And it is not correct and it's not uh, sustainable and it's not productive. All of, most of them are faked unemployment and they are not producing and not to the, uh, to the economy. So innovation, creativity, entrepreneurship, leadership, all of that comes with the private sector. So I think we, uh, it's important for any government to focus on, uh, on those important areas. Frank, you are muted. Thanks, Mohammed. So we have about 20 minutes left in our presentation for today. I um, want to remind folks that uh, it just posted in the chat function our Twitter address if you'd like to follow these issues. The Twitter handle is at site underscore ACGC. You can also see on your screen our email address if you'd like to sign up for daily uh, news about COVID-19 and corruption. Our next question is for Alexandra Gillis, and it comes from Matthew Chevalier, who asks, the COVID-19 crisis will push countries to increase their debt and oil reserves. Uh, I'm sorry, will, will push countries to increase their debt, and oil reserves are probably going to be used as back loans. Is this debt going to be a source of corruption? Is it a strong risk? What should we expect? Thanks, Matthew, for that question. Um, Oil-rich countries have commonly used their oil reserves either to, or, or oil production to either repay loans or as collateral. Um, sometimes it's the government that enters into these deals, and sometimes it's the national oil company acting kind of apart from the government that enters into the, these types of loans. And in the work that we've done on them at NRGI, it's clear that they suffer from so such a lack of transparency and accountability. They can be huge, and yet the most basic information about the terms, the repayment schedule, et cetera, including how the repayment schedule will be impacted and changes in the oil price is totally opaque. Um, so there is absolutely the possibility for abuse, whether outright corruption in terms of bribery, which we have seen in some oil back loan deals, or a regime deciding to prioritize the need for cash right now over the longer term public interest and entering into a bad deal um, over the longer term. So you, you mentioned that they might, that oil producing governments might be tempted to enter into these kinds of loans right now. And that is the case. I mean, that, that is probably true because they are facing such financial duress. But, you know, creditors are not going to be leaping at the chance to provide resource backed loans right now because the oil market is so uncertain and uncertain and prices are so low. And so governments or national oil companies would have to offer incredibly attractive terms in order to get creditors interested in that kind of, of lending. I, I think what's almost more interesting is what's happening right now to existing resource backed loans that these entities are were struggling to repay anyway and now are really struggling. Um, there's a lot of discussion around 
debt relief and debt suspension in the context of the pandemic and the global slowdown. The G20 have made some commitments, as has the Paris Club, and some private sector lenders have also indicated that they may consider debt suspension during this time. Um, it's very unclear the extent to which resource-backed loans will be included in any of this debt relief, um, in part because the major lenders are various Chinese entities, including kind of government-run development banks or Chinese state-owned enterprises. Um, and while China participated in the G20 statement, it's unclear whether their kind of agreement to offer debt suspension will include those other kind of quasi-state entities or not. And then the other major lending group are commodity trading companies like Glencore, Trafigura, Gunvor, um, and, and they haven't indicated any kind of um, overarching plan to participate in these debt relief initiatives. And there's a few countries for which this is a huge deal. I mean, Venezuela, um, Angola, South Sudan, Congo Brazzaville, and a few others are heavily indebted to these kinds of actors um, via oil back loans. They're trying to renegotiate right now because they can't, they can't come repay according to the original terms. And again, those rene renegotiations and how those deals are being struck um, are, are basically happening behind closed doors and are of a lot of concern to us and others um, worried about corruption and accountability issues in the oil sector. Thank you, Alex. Um, moving on, our next question goes to, uh, to Dr. Ariel Cohen, and this one, slightly reworded for clarity um, and brevity. The question for you, um, for you, Ariel, is I'm wondering what are the effects and risks of reduced corruption funds or corrupt money sloshing around in the countries discussed? So for example, where in Russia, the proceeds of corruption are used to prop up politician, does this lead to risks? And so this is something we've been discussing at site a fair amount. And I think fundamentally, the, the question, perhaps a naive one on my part would be, so if these, if you know, revenue derived from the sale of oil is used to, to prop up corrupt structures and whole governance regimes in these countries, specifically Russia, um, as the price has plummeted, what does that mean? Does that put stress on those structures? Will they look for new revenue? What can we expect to see? Um, I'm struggling with this because um, the collapse of the Soviet Union for those of us old enough to remember it, uh, as I do, um, was connected to the decline of oil prices and the war in Afghanistan that the Soviet Union was losing. So the sense that the ideology of Soviet socialism and the very old uh, men who were ruling in the Politburo, uh, Brezhnev, then there was the KGB chief Yuri Andropov, and then uh, Brezhnev Chief of Staff, uh, Konstantin Chernyenko. Uh, this was the sense in the country that they are running out of steam. Uh, today, uh, the leaders are getting older. Uh, there are not one, but two, if not three, younger generations. Uh, the generation of 20-year-olds who do not remember a different leader rather than Mr. Putin. And the generation of 30 and 40-year-olds who were maybe the teen, in their teens or in their 20s uh, when Putin came to power. These people feel that they don't have what the Russians call social lifts, social opportunities to rise, including politically. So there's a lot of pent up frustration that we can see, but Russia has a huge collective trauma from the 1917 revolution. Uh, as long as there's food and as long as there's no uh, major defeat in the war, I don't think people will rise. But you're asking a very good question. Where the money is going to co be coming from? And if not the money, what are the substitutes for uh, buying political power or influencing people? And in the past, as we saw in the Crimea um, in 1914, uh, in 20, 2014, it was nationalism. It was a um, military 
victory or seizure of territory. Is Mr. Putin is a risk taker in, uh, enough to try it again? My hunch is yes, possibly, but he is also a calculating, uh, cold, uh, calculating politician. He's not um, an emotional uh, politician, and he will try to make sure that if he does something like that, the chances for victory are very high. So in terms of uh, oil prices going down, yes, there'll be less money uh, in um, the pot. And we saw already oligarchs ju justling and joking for power uh, to cut uh, the cake, to cut the pie uh, more and more, uh, even before COVID and before the decline of oil prices. Russia, year on year, if you go and look at um, capital flight, it is a capital flight country. People do not want to invest their money in Russia. They park it offshore. They, this is how we got the Panama Papers uh, scandal. They park it onshore in real estate in London and Miami and uh, Côte d'Azur in France. Um, so if there's less money, one, there'll be more competition. I mentioned already government um, contracts, um, uh, COVID, anti-COVID work, infrastructure projects, etc. But at the same time, I believe there'll be more and more calls for transparency, uh, for um, oil revenue being directed towards the people. This is not a monarchy. It's an authoritarian regime that is going to uh, extend the time horizon for the autocrat. But there is a, pol a body politic in Russia, even in uh, today's challenging circumstances. Hello. Uh, thank you very much, Ariel. So we've got a little less than 10 minutes left. If um if folks have sort of lightning questions that they would like to put forward, um, please put them in the chat function. Just type your question in there. Um, as a reminder, we will be back next Wednesday uh, with the same COVID-19 and corruption event uh, series. We'll be focusing on Southeast Asia with presenters from Kuala Lumpur, Singapore, and Jakarta. So please uh, tune in for that. That's at a very early start time, 7 a.m. in the morning, Washington time, and that's so that we can uh, make it accessible for our audience in, in Asia. So the next question is a loose translation of uh, something posted in, in Arabic in the chat function. Question to you, Mohammed, regarding Iraq. If we, if we look at the degree of accountability being demanded by citizens in, in the areas where you are working, so in other words, the, the ways in which people who live there are asking for accountability on how oil revenue is, is spent, is the COVID-19 crisis a factor? In other words, is there sort of a heightened level of people's engagement because of this public health crisis coming at the same time as the crisis in oil revenue? So that's a question for you, Mohammed. Uh, thank you, thank you, Frank. Thank you so much. Um, uh, actually, uh, yes, I think I think there is an effect in uh, uh, in that regard. The uh, the closed spaces, uh, the uh, the curfews, uh, the lockdown, uh, all of that is affecting the uh, the oversight. Uh, all of that is affecting uh, any monitoring activities that can uh, can be done by the uh, by both, uh, like the civil society and uh, and also by the uh, the governmental uh, uh, monitoring apparatuses. Because uh, in normal in normal cases, you can find that, uh, uh, for example, uh, the government or the Ministry of Finance is not cooperating with uh, uh, with the uh, uh, with the Honest Integrity uh, Commission. Uh, the Integrity Commission is one of the uh, uh, monitoring uh, apparatus. Uh, they are also not cooperating with the Supreme. Uh, uh, audit council it's also one of the major uh, 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 monitoring uh, bodies in the government uh, so
uh, uh, so the uh, uh, the the thing is that uh, you can imagine uh, that uh, the uh, like the Supreme Audit Council is uh, uh, they have like dedicated auditors uh, to uh, to do and uh, uh, audit the uh, the uh, uh, the files of the Ministry of Finance and they are ne even not given an office to sit in. Uh, the Integrity Commission uh, requests are. Uh, uh, are also not cooperated with and uh, uh, and ignored and uh, over influenced by the uh, the uh, uh, the corrupt officials or the uh, the political parties uh, so that is in normal cases so how about how about covid nineteen where uh, you know people are unable to move uh, offices are not uh, operating in full capacity uh, i mean the government is not in full capacity so all of that gives uh, incentives and gives opportunities for uh, for more corruption because the oversight and uh, monitoring capacity is uh, is absent. Uh, and also, I noticed from the question our uh, our uh, friend posted in in Arabic. It's not uh, actually a question. I'll just like uh, uh, give a general uh, translation. He is he is agreeing with us that. Uh, uh, his name is Mr. Nasser. Uh, he's agreeing with us that the current government is uh, focusing more on uh, the expenditure rather than collecting uh, uh, like of other uh, non-oil revenues, uh, which is correct. I mean, it needs to, to make a balance. Uh, it needs to collect from, uh, from any possible non-oil un, uh, revenues and also uh, to uh, make sure that the expenditure is uh, is wise and balanced. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed. So we're coming down the home stretch. If the um, if the folks answering the questions in this next case, um, uh, Dr. Alexandra Gillis could be very very quick. Um, Alexandra, I'm going to give you a double barreled question. Um, so this one coming from a couple different questioners. One would be, if you hold on one second, I'll find it here, um, regarding the, um, what are the chances for oil sector reform in Nigeria during this low price period, uh, given the fact that oil sector reform legislation has been introduced? So that's one question, what are the chances of oil sector reform? And the other one very quickly is, would Nigeria face a social collapse if oil remains below $50 a barrel? through 2021 and beyond. So two questions, very quick if you can, thank you. Just two easy questions to address quickly, <laughs> thanks. Um, so the oil sector reform legislation that's been pending in Nigeria for 12 years, 13 years, um, going nowhere, has a couple different elements. And it's a very good time for one of them and it's a very bad time for another. I'll start with the bad time. So one of the aims of that reform effort back when oil prices were really high was to renegotiate some of the contracts with the oil companies so that the government received a greater share of the revenues. Some of the contracts were old, the tax terms were overly favorable to the companies and they need to be revisited. When, high, when prices were high, that was the time to move on that agenda because the government had more leverage because the oil companies were, you know, super eager to have access to the country's oil reserves and they would have paid for it. Now is the worst time to, for the government to try to renegotiate fiscal terms with oil companies who are, in many cases, either struggling to stay afloat financially or looking to exit the country. So I think that part of the agenda is really stuck right now. Another part of it, and I think the more important part, is an effort to reform the National Oil Company, which plays this dominant and often quite negative role in the sector. Um, in particular, its ability to spend money in a discretionary way um, that, that, that tends to be quite expensive and under previous governments um, was, a, was a site of, of corruption and, and abuse. Now would be the right time to do that because the government's looking for any possible way to save money. 
Um, and, and the National Oil Company is a place, if you're looking to save money, there's some real structural reforms that, would, that should urgently take place there. Will they happen? It's still a very heavy lift, even with that major fiscal motive in place. It would require a multi-year effort that would extend past the, the current um, president's second term, which ends in a few years, um, and would require you know, a real kind of visionary, dedicated leadership um, that it's a little bit difficult to see it emerging um, currently where there just hasn't been a lot of change or, or ambitious reform um, in the last few years. Um, so I'm a bit pessimistic that even though there is that motive now to kind of cut costs and have the sector governance become more efficient, whether there'll actually be major change. And then to the bigger point about whether, you know, low oil prices will bring social collapse, the Nigerian government is much more dependent on oil than the Nigerian economy is. So oil revenues constitute the majority of global of, of government revenues but actually the gdp of of nigeria and the livelihood of nigerian people is much more diversified than a lot of people think so i think the real question is whether the kind of elite bargain that is integral to kind of how nigerian politics works will stay in place um, ra rather than there being some kind of mass uprising you know nigeria has a very diverse political elite power changes hands often it's very different from other african oil producing countries in that way um and rotating access to oil revenues has been an integral part of how that system has functioned over the years um and it's i think it's unclear I, personally, I don't think that lower oil revenues will cause that elite bargain to fall apart. I think it will evolve instead, and it could potentially evolve in, in healthy ways. Um, but it certainly does shake things up a little bit, and I wouldn't um, claim to be able to tell the future in any way that anyone should bank on. Thanks. Thank you, Alex. And that's a great way to wrap up this session um, with, a, with a dose of humility regarding the future and our inability to predict. Um, I wanted to say thank you to everybody who took part, especially our speakers, um, who put a lot of time preparing and getting ready for this presentation. Um, wanted to urge folks, if you'd like to stay informed on this topic, COVID-19 and corruption, just write to us so the address is in front of you. And thanks also to the folks behind the scenes at site, Caitlin Nykum, uh, Kai Bernier-Chen, and everybody else who pitched in with the presentation putting on this event. We'll see you next Wednesday at 7 a.m. Um, and thanks again for joining. Take care. يبدو انتهى الوبنار تحدثنا لكم جدنا الآن على هذا هذه النادة شكرا جزيلا
Okay, I think it's just us left minus Muhammad. He's no longer on the call. Frank, did you want to do any sort of um, wrap-up finisher?